Thousands of years ago, on this planet we call Earth, our planet was visited by various groups of extraterrestrial humanoid beings. These extraterrestrial humanoid beings had to leave their planet, and seek refuge here on Earth because their home planet had been destroyed by evil. When these extraterrestrial humanoid beings arrived on Earth, they chose to take residence inside the center of the Earth, because the surface of the Earth was inhabited by human beings. At this point in time in Earth's history, the human beings who lived on the surface of the Earth were all of one tribe, the Ebonoid tribe. Since they live inside the Earth, these extraterrestrial beings have now become interterrestrial beings. The center of the Earth where these interterrestrial beings reside also contains an inner sun. The inner Earth has been called by a variety of names by cultures around the world including Shambhala by Buddhist, Agartha by Tibetans, Kurnuji by the ancient Mesopotamians, the Duat or Aminta by the ancient Egyptians, Hades or the Underworld by Europeans, Shivalba by the Mayans, and in modern times, the concept of the inner Earth has given rise to what is called the Hollow Earth Theory. Unbeknownst to many human beings, the activities of these beings which reside inside the Earth has affected the course of human history and human development. The first and most noble of the beings which resides inside the Earth is called the Shayuk. Compared to human beings, the Shayuk would be considered geniuses with exceptional intelligence, and telepathic and telekinetic abilities. The Shayuk have a dark brown skin complexion, they are between 5 feet to 7 feet tall, and their heads, brains, and cranial capacity is much wider and larger than the average human. The Shayuk come to the Earth's surface occasionally to teach and to trade with certain tribes of human beings. The teachings of the Shayuk are so profound that when they come to the Earth's surface to teach, they are often called deities, gods, priests, prophets, messengers, and seers, and because of this fact, the Shayuk have strict laws which limit the interaction of Shayuk tribal members' contact with the humans on the surface. The Shayuk commonly interact and have mixed in with the surface world humans called the Danakil or Danakil, also known as the Afar people, in present-day Eritrea, Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Somalia. The chief of the Shayuk is named King Fyokor, and his daughter is named Princess Radiya, and two of his brothers are named Amo, and Yishak, who has always been jealous of his brother King Fyokor. King Fyokor's brother Amo had fallen in love with a surface-dwelling human female, and he would sneak to the surface world to visit her, and would also pass himself off to the surface-dwelling humans as a psychic and a magician, and for these acts, Amo was exiled to live on the surface, 20 miles outside of the present-day city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. As long as the people in the inner earth spent most of their life in the inner earth, then they will not die, however, to be exiled to the surface world means a person from inner earth will eventually die like the mortals on the surface. In the caverns adjacent to the Shayuk, resides another group of nobles called the Sinin. The Sinin are also highly intelligent, but also have a fighting spirit. The Sinin are between 5 feet to 7 feet tall and have a variety of complexions from yellow to brown, and they are hairless and are most noted for their cone-shaped heads. The Sinin commonly interact and have mixed with surface world humans including the ancient Egyptians, the Almecs in present-day Central America, the Mangatug people in the African Congo, and the Parcas people in Peru. The chief of the Sinin is named King Lamsa, and his daughter is named Princess Lucina, and his son is named Prince Atif. One of the wretched group of beings which resides inside the earth is called the Samin. The Samin are grotesquely obese, pale, with long elephant-like noses, and are very negative and aggressive. The Samin were actually the manifested evil grafted out of the Sinin on their home world prior to these beings arriving on Earth. Since the Samin were grafted out of the Sinin, it is the responsibility of the Sinin to police and keep in check the evil activities of the Samin. It is said that an American named Richard Sharpshaver encountered the Sinin and called them the Turos, meaning interrogative robot, and he also encountered the Samin and called them Duros, meaning detrimental robot. One day, the wretched Samin raided and invaded the village of the Shayuk stealing food and terrorizing the Shayuk family. When King Fyokor found out about this invasion by the Samin, he sent a telepathic message to King Lamsa stating that the Sinin has neglected their responsibility to keep the Samin in check, because the Samin were currently raiding and invading the village of the Shayuk. Upon receiving the telepathic message from King Fyokor, King Lamsa went with his brethren to the caverns of the Shayuk to stop the invasion by the Samin and to drive the Samin back to whence they came. After driving the Samin away from the lands of the Shayuk, King Lamsa apologized to King Fyokor, but tension remained between the Shayuk and the Sinin for some time after the incident. In order to make peace between the Shayuk and the Sinin, King Lamsa offered his daughter Princess Lucina to be a wife of King Fyokor. King Fyokor accepted the peace offering from King Lamsa, and in turn offered his daughter Princess Radiya to be the wife of King Lamsa's son Prince Atif, as was the custom, 
and there was peace in the land for some time between the two tribes of the Shayuk and the Sinin. However, King Lamsa's daughter Princess Lusana was angered and outraged because she did not want her father to give her away to be the wife of the Shayuk King Fulkor. Princess Lusana felt like an outcast and out of place living amongst the Shayuk people, and she did not like living by the strict laws of the Shayuk people. Princess Lusana always wanted to marry a man from her own people the Sinin, and she did not want to be married to a Shayuk man. One day Princess Lusana, now the unhappy wife of King Fulkor, met Yashok, the jealous brother of King Fulkor, and they conspired together based on their hatred for King Fulkor to have an illicit sexual affair together behind the back of King Fulkor. Princess Lusana and Yashok would travel to the surface world to the home of Ammo, the exiled brother of King Fulkor and Yashok, and it is here where they would have their illicit affair. This affair between Princess Lusana and Yashok went on for months with them sneaking back and forth from the inner earth to the surface world, and eventually Princess Lusana became pregnant. In her pregnant state, Princess Lusana would not return to the land of the inner earth, but would remain at the home of Ammo, and Yashok would stay with her. It was here in the home of Ammo, 20 miles outside of the present-day city of Mecca Saudi Arabia, where the child Yakub was born to Yashok and Princess Lusana. The child Yakub being part Shayuk and part Sinin, had an enormous head the size of two men, and he also had two brains. Knowing that they could not return to the inner earth because their affair had now produced a child, Yashok and Princess Lusana decided to live and raise the baby Yakub for five years in the home of Ammo, 20 miles outside of the present-day city of Mecca Saudi Arabia. Yakub's father Yashok would work as a scientist and a priest amongst the humans on the surface calling himself by the title Mornuakan, the last high priest. Back in inner earth, Yashok and Princess Lusana had been missing for years, and eventually it was found out by King Fulkor about the affair between his wife Princess Lusana and his brother Yashok. King Fulkor ordered his soldiers to go to the home of his brother Ammo and arrest Yashok for his crime, and according to the laws of the Shayuk, Yashok was put to death. Princess Lusana's life was spared because she now had a child to take care of, but her punishment was to remain exiled to the surface world living in the home of Ammo, and to never return to inner earth. Depressed about her inability to return home, overwhelmed by her new responsibility to raise a child, and saddened by the death of her lover Yashok, Princess Lusana kills herself by committing suicide. The five-year-old child Yakub, now an orphan, is raised by his uncle Ammo, and the child Yakub is emotionally disturbed and rebellious because of the death of his parents. The child Yakub grows to hate his people the Shayuk, and he also grows to hate all dark complexion people because he blames them for the death of his parents. The child Yakub desires to have his revenge when he grows up. Yakub starts school at the age of four, and is teased and mocked about the size of his head by the surface dwelling human children. This mockery and teasing about the size of his head that Yakub experienced as a child created low self esteem, and further infuriated the already deranged Yakub, fueling his desire for revenge. Yakub's uncle Ammo would tell Yakub stories about the beings in the inner earth and how the Samin were the manifestation of the evil grafted out of Yakub's mother's family, the Sinin. One day, when Yakub was six years old, he was playing with two steel magnets in the home of his uncle Ammo, and Yakub noticed the magnetic power of attraction and repulsion that unalike attracts, and like repels. By observing this, Yakub was inspired with a determined idea to create a tribe unlike any of the people on the surface of the planet, and this unalike tribe would be weak and wicked, and attract the other tribes on the surface of the planet, and rule over them with the knowledge of tricks and lies for 6,000 years. Upon coming to this realization, Yakub looked up at his uncle Ammo and said, Uncle, when I get to be an old man, I am going to make a people who shall rule you. Uncle Ammo said, What will you make, someone to make mischief and cause bloodshed in the land? Yakub responded to his uncle Ammo by saying, Nevertheless, uncle, I know that which you do not know, and it was at that moment, the boy Yakub first came into the knowledge of just who he was, born to make trouble, break peace, kill and destroy, and be the enemy to the ebonoid people of Earth. Yakub knew in order to accomplish his plan he would have to study science, biology, and genetics. Yakub was a child prodigy in school, being exceptionally smarter than the surface dwelling humans he was going to school with, and by the age of 18, Yakub had finished all of the colleges and universities of his nation. While in college, Yakub was mocked and teased being called the big head scientist. After graduating from the colleges and universities of his nation, Yakub began to preach a new doctrine to the people in the city. Yakub called his new doctrine Tricknology and his holy book was called the Book of Tricknology of 120 degrees. Yakub taught that if people followed his doctrine, then they would be able to rule the world for 6,000 years, and make slaves out of everyone else on the earth. 
Yaqub made such impressions on the people that many people began following him, the children who once mocked and teased Yaqub were now requesting to be part of what he was teaching, the girls who once laughed at Yaqub were now women who desired him. As Yaqub's teachings spread, he made more and more converts to his new doctrine, and the power of Yaqub's doctrine began to intimidate the king of the surface dwelling humans who ordered to have Yaqub and all of his followers thrown in prison. The police arrested all of Yaqub's followers and put them in prison, and filled up all of the prison cells with Yaqub's followers. However, there was not enough space to put all of Yaqub's followers in jail, therefore there were still some people free who were spreading Yaqub's teachings. The police notified the king that they did not have enough space for all of Yaqub's followers, and at that point the king decided to go to Yaqub's prison cell and negotiate a deal. The king went to visit Yaqub in his prison cell and the king said, So you are Mr. Yaqub. Yaqub said, Yes I am. The king said, Yaqub, I have come to see if we could work out some agreement that would bring about an end to this trouble. What would you suggest? Yaqub said to the king, If you give me and my followers everything to start a civilization, and furnish us with money and other necessities of life for twenty years, I will take my followers and we will leave. The king was pleased with the deal offered by Yaqub, and agreed to take care of them for twenty years, until Yaqub's followers were able to go for themselves. After 20 years, the government began to make preparation for the exiling of Yaqub and his followers. The king ordered everyone rounded up who was a believer in Yaqub's doctrine, and they took them to the seaport and loaded them on ships. When Yaqub and his followers departed there were a total of 59,999 followers plus Yaqub making 60,000 total people on 100 ships. Yaqub and his fleet of ships departed from an area 20 miles outside of the present-day city of Mecca Saudi Arabia, and set sail on the Red Sea and sailed all the way around the continent of Africa to go to their destination which was the area which is currently called the island of Patmos, or Palam, in the Aegean Sea. While on the ships sailing around Africa to get to the area which is currently called the island of Patmos, Yakub began the second part of his plan which was a eugenics human gravitation experiment. Even though all of the people on the surface of the earth were of one tribe, the Ebonoid tribe, there was still some variation within the Ebonoid tribe, and Yakub began to highlight these differences, and Yaqub taught these people that they were special, because Yaqub planned to use them to graft his new tribe. Yaqub developed his theory by studying his own genetics under the microscope and noticing that there were two different genes in him, one gene that was dark from his father Yishak's family the Shayuk, and the other that was not dark from his mother Princess Lucina's family the Sinin. Yaqub began to have children with the women on this ship, and the babies which were born that were a lighter complexion he would spare their life, but the babies which were born which were of a darker complexion, Yaqub would have thrown overboard into the ocean. Yaqub felt if he could successfully separate the darker gene from the lighter gene, then he could graft the ebonoid tribe into its last stage, which would be albinoid. Yaqub planned to create a tribe of albinoids, which he discovered was weaker than the ebonoid gene, which would be unalike, to rule the ebonoid nation for 6,000 years. When Yaqub's followers found out about his new wicked plan, and learned that he was killing and throwing babies overboard into the ocean, 95% of his followers lost their loyalty to Yaqub, and abandoned his mission and jumped ship. As Yaqub's fleet of ships sailed around Africa, people who lost loyalty to his mission would jump ship into the areas which are now Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Djibouti, Somalia, Mozambique, Namibia, Senegal, Morocco, and Tunisia. 10% of the original 60,000 of Yaqub's followers betrayed Yaqub and jumped ship, 85% of the original 60,000 of Yaqub's followers jumped ship because they were confused why he would do such a horrible thing, leaving only 5% of the original 60,000 of Yaqub's followers who actually made it to their destination of the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. As king on his island, Yaqub set up birth control and planned parenthood laws which would contribute to his plan of negative eugenics and genocide to breed his albinoid tribe. Yaqub made it a law that only the lighter complexion people could have children. People with darker complexions were put to death, and when children were born, nurses were ordered to have the darker babies killed by pricking the brains with a sharp needle as soon as the child's head was out of the mother, but the lighter babies were allowed to live. Yaqub's aim was to kill and destroy the ebonoid nation. Yaqub would have the dead bodies of the darker babies fed to wild beasts, and if they could not find a wild beast to feed the bodies to, they would take the dead bodies of the babies to a cremator to be burned, this is the level of intense hatred Yaqub had in his heart. This process went on for years on Yaqub's island as Yaqub trained his sons and grandsons to carry on his work after he died, Yaqub died at the age of 150 years old from a brain tumor. As the father of Trichnology, Yaqub taught his people a doctrine which would enable them to rule the world for 6,000 years, 
Yaqub also taught his people that God is a spirit and a spook and not a man, and Yaqub was the founder of the doctrine that unlike attracts and like repels. After 200 years on Yaqub's island, all of the darker babies had been done away with, and all babies were born of a new tribe called the Rubedoid tribe. After another 200 years, all babies were born of an even newer tribe called the Citronoid tribe. And finally, after another 200 years, which makes 600 years total, all the babies born on Yaqub's island were of Yaqub's desired albinoid tribe. It took 600 years to breed Yaqub's albinoid tribe, and every imagination of their heart and all of their actions were wicked continuously. The evilness of the albinoids not only affected themselves, but also affected the other peoples of the world. Yaqub's albinoids returned to the city where they were exiled from. Once back in the city, it took only six months for Yaqub's albinoids to cause chaos and war amongst the ebonoid people. The king of the ebonoid people realized that it was Yaqub's albinoids who were causing all the trouble, and the king made a decree to drive Yaqub's evil albinoids from amongst them. The king rounded up all of Yaqub's albinoids and stripped them of their clothing, and put an apron on them to hide their nakedness, and sent his army with them across the desert to cross the burning sands into the place which is modern-day Europe. Yaqub's albinoids were roped into the mountains and caves and the king's army would patrol the area to make sure Yaqub's albinoids stayed in the mountains and caves for 2,000 years to ensure that these people are kept away from the ebonoid people. During this 2,000-year period living in the mountains and caves without anything to start civilization, Yaqub's albinoids became shameless, and lost all sense of shame and started going nude, and in the winter they wore animal skins for clothes and grew hair all over their bodies and faces like all the other wild animals. Yaqub's albinoids tamed the wolves and dogs to live in the caves with them, and after some time the dog held a high place among their family becoming their best friend. After 2,000 years of living in the caves, the wickedness of Yaqub's albinoids was observed, and an ebonoid man named Moshe was sent to civilize them. Moshe led Yaqub's albinoids out of the caves, however once out of the caves, Yaqub's albinoids killed Moshe. Free from the caves, Yaqub's albinoids went on a rampage throughout the earth conquering and subjecting the ebonoid people, pitting one against the other using the idea of divide and conquer. Yaqub's albinoids began to execute Yaqub's plan for them to rule the world for 6,000 years. A man named Mahamdu, attempted to teach Yaqub's albinoids to convince them to end their devilishment, however this was still 1400 years before the end of Yaqub's albinoids 6,000 year period of dominion over the earth. And so, Yaqub's albinoids ruled the earth for 6,000 years spreading their devilishment, evil, pain, suffering, and oppression to the ebonoid people of the earth as designed by the big head scientist Yaqub. The events of Yaqub occurred approximately 6,600 years ago, and the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth foresaw the birth of Yaqub 15,000 years ago. This history, or future, of Yaqub and his people was predicted and foretold by the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth 8,400 years before the birth of Yaqub. The 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth were aware of the birth of Yaqub, and they were aware of the things Yaqub would do before Yaqub was even born. The 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth predicted that in the year 8400, this man Yaqub would be born, and when this man was born, he will change civilization and the world, and produce a new tribe of people, who would rule the original ebonoid people for 6000 years, from the 9000th year to the 15000th year. After the 6000 year rule of Yaqub's people, the ebonoid people would give birth to one whose wisdom, knowledge and power would be infinite. One whom the world would recognize as being the greatest and mightiest since the creation of the universe, and, that Yaqub's old warring wicked world would be removed and destroyed, and the ebonoid nation would be restored into power to rule forever and to establish a world of peace and righteousness. This great redeemer of the ebonoid people who was predicted by the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth to bring balance back into the world, is known under many names, titles, and attributes including, he who has no equal, he who there never was anyone like, the supreme being, the mighty, the wise, the best knower, the light, the life giver, the guide, the all powerful, he who knows how to reproduce the universe and the people of his choice. But his mother calls him Yashmal. Yashmal was the son of Princess Radiya of the Shayuk family, and Prince Atif the Sinin family. Yashmal's parents, Princess Radiya and Prince Atif, married each other in order to establish peace between their two quarreling tribes. However, the union of Princess Radiya and Prince Atif was more than mere chance, their union was specifically guided, selected, and arranged by the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth who were also genetic engineers. They knew that the offspring of the union between Princess Radiya and Prince Atif would be the personification of order to balance out and offset the chaos of Yaqub, 
who was the offspring of Yashok and Princess Lucina. Yashmal began his education on the day he was born, as is the custom amongst members of the Shayuk. It would be unheard of for a member of the Shayuk to wait until the age of four to start school unless the child was mentally handicapped. Being part Shayuk and part Sinim, Yashmal's head was noticeably larger than the other members of the Shayuk and Sinim. Yashmal had an enormous head, two brains, and a third enlarged pineal gland which sat in the center of his two brains, making the top of his head appearing to be shaped like three orbs. Amongst the Shayuk and Sinim, Yashmal would be called the big head scientist. However, amongst these tribes, this statement was not taken to be an insult, but rather a compliment, alluding to the individual's intelligence in the same way that saying big muscles alludes to an individual's strength. Since Yashmal was raised in his native land amongst his people who looked like him, he did not suffer from the same ridicule, mockery, and low self-esteem which plagued his cousin Yakub who grew up in a foreign land amongst other than self and kind. As a child, Yashmal was an exceptional prodigy and a genius. Yashmal was also told stories of the evil activities which transpired at the hands of his cousin Yakub. One day, when Yashmal was nine years old, he was playing with two electromagnets in the home of his grandfather King Fyokor, and noticed that electrons flowing in the same direction through two electromagnets would create the magnetic phenomenon of attraction, and that electrons flowing in opposite directions through two electromagnets would create the magnetic phenomenon of repulsion. By observing this, Yashmal realized that like flowing energies create attraction and unlike flowing energies create repulsion. Thus, Yashmal was inspired with a determined idea to direct the flow of mental energy of the ebonoid people of the planet in the same direction so that the ebonoid people of the planet will be unified again to be strong and righteous, and bring peace and balance back to the earth forever. Upon coming to this realization, Yashmal looked up at his grandfather King Fyokur and said, Grandfather, when I get older, I am going to make a people strong and righteous, and I will eliminate the devilishment which has come into the world to show and prove real power and wisdom, and bring back peace and supreme balancement forever. Grandfather King Fyokur said, What will you make, someone to establish order and cause harmony in the world? Yashmal said, Man plans, and I plan, and surely I am the better planner. And it was at that moment, the boy Yashmal first came into the knowledge of just who he was, born to establish order, bring peace, build, create, and be the redeemer to the ebonoid peoples of earth. It is common for members of the Shayuk tribe to finish all of the coursework taught in all of the colleges and universities of the surface world by age 9, but Yashmal finished by age 7. If it took a member of the Shayuk tribe until age 18 to finish all of the coursework taught in all of the colleges and universities of the surface world, then that person would surely be looked at as being mentally handicapped or mentally retarded. Yashmal finished all of the advanced universal sciences which are taught by the schools in the inner earth by the time he was age 12, even though it is common to finish this coursework by age 15, but Yashmal was a genius and a prodigy. After finishing school, Yashmal met with the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth and told them of his intention to travel to the surface world as a bringer of peace and redeemer of the ebonoid people. Yashmal was tried and tested by the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth, and once found worthy, at age 18, Yashmal traveled to the area presently known as the Mwanza region near the countries of Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya in Africa. Yashmal called his new doctrine Teachnology and his holy book was called the Book of Teachnology of 720 Degrees, which was in a question and answer format designed to get the mental energies of the listeners flowing in the same direction which would in turn create unity, harmony, and attraction amongst kindred. Yashmal's new doctrine was so powerful that he had millions of people from all of the tribes on the earth coming to hear his message and aspiring to be a part of his mission. However, from the millions of followers that he gained on the surface of the earth, Yashmal only selected 144,000 which he called the chosen few, to be a part of the next phase of his plan, and when Yashmal and his chosen few departed, he told the people on the surface of the earth he would be back in one day. So Yashmal selected 41,150 ebonoid females and 41,140 ebonoid males for a total of 82,290 people from the original ebonoid tribe. Yashmal selected 10,285 rubedoid females and 10,285 rubedoid males for a total of 20,570 people from the rubedoid tribe. Yashmal selected 10,285 citronoid females and 10,285 citronoid males for a total of 20,570 people from the citronoid tribe. And Yashmal selected 10,285 albinoid females and 10,285 albinoid males for a total of 20,570 people from the albinoid tribe, which made 144,000 people total. 
Yashmal took his followers into the inner earth through an opening beneath the Great Lake in the present-day area known as the Mwanza region in Africa to begin his eugenics genetic engineering experiment of grafting the various tribes of people on the earth back into the original Ebonoid tribe. Yashmal being a master genetic engineer who was all wise, right, and exact, knew that it was not necessary to kill anyone in order to accomplish his goal because he had knowledge of the science of dominant and recessive genes. Knowing that the Ebonoid tribe was the first, then Yashmal knew the Ebonoid gene would be the most dominant, followed by the Rubedoid gene, followed by the Citrinoid gene, and lastly followed by the Albinoid gene. While inside the inner earth with his followers, Yashmal applied the science of dominant and recessive genes to design and engineer a system of arranged marriages by which the offspring born from each arranged marriage would have certain desirable qualities, and in time over a period of 900 years, all of the derivative tribes would have been grafted back into the original Ebonoid tribe. Yashmal also observed that the gene of the Ebonoid woman was the most dominant gene, and so Yashmal established the following rules of arranged marriages amongst his followers. 10,285 Ebonoid women and 10,285 Ebonoid men would marry to keep the Ebonoid gene strong and pure. 10,285 Ebonoid women would marry 10,285 Rubenoid men. 10,285 Ebonoid women would marry 10,285 Citrinoid men. 10,285 Ebonoid women would marry 10,285 Albinoid men. 10,285 Ebonoid men would marry 10,285 Rubenoid women. 10,285 Ebonoid men would marry 10,285 Citrinoid women. 10,285 Ebonoid men would marry 10,285 Albinoid women. Yashmal would also keep 10 Ebonoid women as wives for himself. The men and women were required to get married by age 19, and each couple were to have two children. Living in the inner earth where he was from, Yashmal was continuously regenerated and rejuvenated and did not die like his cousin Yakub on the surface of the earth. Yashmal was able to teach, socialize, laugh, play with the children, enjoy life, and observe the generations and progression of his followers over the centuries. The offspring of the Ebonoid woman and the Ebonoid man would always be Ebonoid. The offspring of the Ebonoid woman and the Rubedoid man would also be Ebonoid because of the strength of the Ebonoid woman's genes. The offspring of the Ebonoid woman and the Citrinoid man would be Ebonoid 75% of the time, and Rubedoid 25% of the time, because of the strength of the Ebonoid woman's genes. The offspring of the Ebonoid woman and the Albinoid man would be Ebonoid 75% of the time, and Citrinoid 25% of the time, because of the strength of the Ebonoid woman's genes. The offspring of the Ebonoid man and the Rubedoid woman would be Ebonoid 75% of the time, and Rubedoid 25% of the time. The offspring of the Ebonoid man and the Citrinoid woman would be Rubedoid. The offspring of the Ebonoid man and the Albinoid woman would be Citrinoid. With the laws of arranged marriages in place, it would take Yashmal's chosen 144,000 people 46 generations over the course of 900 years to be grafted back into the original Ebonoid tribe. During this time, for some generations recessive genes would tumble forward. After 12 generations, all of the albinoids had been grafted back into the citrinoid, rubedoid, and ebonoid tribes. After another 16 generations, all of the citrinoids had been grafted back into the rubedoids and ebonoids. After another 18 generations, all of the rubedoids had been grafted back into the ebonoids, leaving only the original ebonoid tribe. It was also observed that after 4 generations, if the albinoids refused to mix in, then they would be unable to conceive offspring after the fourth generation. After eight generations, if the citrinoids refused to mix in, then they would be unable to conceive offspring after the eighth generation. After 16 generations, if the rubedoids refused to mix in, then they would be unable to conceive offspring after the 16th generation. Just like electrons flowing from atoms with more electrons to atoms with fewer electrons, it was necessary for the derivative tribes to mix back into the original Ebonoid tribe in order to get recharged and sustain and maintain their existence. However, because of the science of recessive and dominant genes, by mixing back into the original Ebonoid tribe, the derivative tribes would eventually be grafted back into the original Ebonoid tribe in time leaving only the original Ebonoid tribe on the surface of the planet. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. And so Yashmal smiled at this fact now having knowledge that the evil acts done by his cousin Yakub would be reversed just by letting nature take its course. The process of grafting the derivative tribes back into the original Ebonoid tribe took 900 years, and once completed, Yashmal took another 100 years to teach and train his followers how to control and conquer the evil which existed within themselves, rather than attempting to graft the evil out letting it manifest and personify as a being. 
After the 1000 year period with Yashmal in the inner earth, Yashmal returned to the surface of the earth to the area presently known as the Mwanza region in Africa with 144,000 Ebonoid people. When Yashmal and his 144,000 followers returned, the people on the surface of the earth said, Yashmal, you said you would be gone for one day, and you were true to your word, you have only been gone for one day, but many of the people you have returned with are not the same people you left with. What have you done with our brothers and sisters? One of the Ebonoid women named Kidara who was one of Yashmal's wives and one of the 144,000 spoke up and said, I am the daughter and great descendant of your brothers and sisters which it seems to you left with Yashmal just yesterday, but we have been with Yashmal in the inner earth for 1000 years, and Yashmal has taught us the science of genetics and how to rid the world of evil, as well as how to conquer the evil within ourselves. Yashmal spoke and said, Indeed, one day in the inner earth can be like 1000 years. Yashmal's 144,000 followers then proceeded to teach the Ebonoid people on the surface of the earth the way to defeat the evil currently plaguing the earth in the same way that Yashmal had taught them. Yashmal returned to the inner earth with his Ebonoid wife Kidara. After returning to the inner earth, Yashmal was elected to a seat as one of the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth. Yashmal taught Kidara the secret to eternal life and they had many children together. Yashmal told Kidara that the Ebonoid woman is the human representative of nature on the surface of the earth, and thus the Ebonoid woman is the key to destroying the evil plaguing the surface of the earth, and she is the key to bringing peace and balance back to the surface of the earth. Yashmal told Kidara that it was not him who the 24 wise elder scientists of the inner earth had prophesied about, it was her, the Ebonoid woman. Yashmal told Kidara that he was merely a conduit to allow her to bring balance back to the earth, and so while the big head scientist Yashmal's followers execute his plan on the surface of the earth, Yashmal and Kidara wait with their family in the inner earth for the hereafter, that is to say, here on earth, after evil has been removed, and peace and balance has been restored. According to what uh, uh, Master Farad Muhammad taught me on the race question, the origin of the races, uh, the, in the beginning of the races, they numbered around uh, four. And from these four races of people, they has produced many different types of people uh, but they are not uh, say independent uh, in their beginning um, they came from uh, one we say today we have lots of various colored people all over the earth from uh, we say from brown to white. We are not all the same color due to intermixing with uh, such colors as black, brown, yellow, and red, and white. This has produced many other various colors. And uh, the origin of it, according to the teachings of uh, Master Farad Muhammad, to me, was from a scientist, a god, we uh, see him. We see him as a god. Uh, back 6,000 years ago, uh, started a, uh, we say, a, a scientific, or I should say, uh, a master grafting uh, work on the human being to produce a new civilization, a new race of people from the original race of people, our aboriginal people. This man, Yakub, uh, 
who uh, discovered in the joint of uh, the black man that uh, he had uh, two people in him and that he uh, had learned through study and experimenting on germs that uh, this uh, second germ could produce a powerful people uh, that would be able to rule uh, that which they came from. For uh, uh, around 6,000 years until the the father or uh, the aboriginal produces one uh, superior to his man. And that uh, was this, that he taken through experimental work on the germ of man, a people of uh, what we call today a white race. But before he produced it, that white race, he produced it a brown race. He produced it a yellow race, and uh, so on. There is uh, his first uh, grafting from the black man according to the teachings of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom we see him and know him today as being God in person. <clears throat> that uh, this Grafton, uh, in its first stage, he had a brown race of people from a black people. And uh, it taken him, according to the teachings of God, 200 years to produce that brown race. And he kept up the process of uh, killing off the uh, browner or the darker one and marrying the lighter one onto the lighter one. Uh, for another 200 years, he had a uh, uh, yellow race of people. And in this length of time, these brown people were spreading over uh, the airy, uh, I would say, uh, migrating over the earth to find them a home to themselves. And so, the, when the yellow race w was produced, it, uh, he uh, started to migrating over the earth. And uh, from the yellow race, about 200 years, this grafting kept in process, uh, they, there was on this same uh, alert, uh, well, it was an alert, he was on, according to the teachings of Almighty God to me, in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise it do forever. Uh, at that time, 200 years, keeping up birth control law, this is what he established. He established it on this alert, and there was his lab that he was uh, a working, we call it a human lab, to produce his man. And from this yellow race, he had a white race 200 years later from them. And this was the end of his work. This was the man he was trying to get to. That was our white race. And uh, that made it... Uh, uh, in the total time of his grafting out of black, white, 600 years. And uh, this figure uh, tells with the Bible's teaching of uh, the man being created in six days. This is, uh, this days here you have means, uh, uh, a thousand, uh, pardon me, uh, a hundred years each, six hundred years. And this also tallies with the creation of the universe, that's six, uh, the whole entire universe, according to uh, the Quran, was also created in six uh, periods of time. And so, Mr. Yakub the mighty scientist of that time, 
he produced it, his man, on six, because it did tally with the creation of the universe, and it was uh, to this number uh, that he could not further uh, his work. And uh, they would be masters, gods, to rule the earth and the people, everything of life, uh, for 6,000 years. And at the end of 6,000 years, the aboriginal people will uh, have at that time produced it another one, uh, mightier than uh, Yakub in wisdom and knowledge. And uh, he would be equal with that one that uh, created the heavens and the earth. And uh, he would have the power and the infinitive wisdom to make his word B, that's the first one. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, could you please explain Yaqub, grafted devil? What would you like explained about it? But now I do remember, in fact, one of the questions one of the brothers just mentioned. So when he said that a man named Jacob grafted the devil, in the year 8,400 on the island of Pilar, they kept giving figurative places. They was given allegorical interpretation. Yaakov had the head the size of two men. And while in the backyard of his uncle, he discovered while playing with two pieces of metal that unlike attracted the light. And he told his uncle, I'm going to make a devil weak and wicked and give it the power to rule the world for 6,000 years. Then I'm going to come in my own good time and do what? Take the devil off the planet to show and prove that I am a law. This is what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught. And this is what Clarence 13X the head of the nation of five percenters or gods and goddesses, whatever name they chose, they have that right, teaches today. Now let's look into this here. The word Yaakov is Jacob. We know that. It means to take someone else's position. That's what it means, supplant. To, put one, to supplant him in the place of him. All right? Now, if we go back to Jacob's situation, we come up with Jacob's mother, Rebecca, Rebecca trying to deceive Ishak, Isaac, because he was blind. <laughs> he, he was so old, and his vision went on him. Correct? And she preferred the soft son. You see that? The one that was soft, and they also say reddish. You see? You see, we can see the science that Master Farad Muhammad was teaching is deep. <laughs> so, what she did, the woman, was deceive her husband into giving the blessings of the household to Jacob as opposed to Esau. You follow that? Rebecca or Rebecca deceived her husband, Isaac, into giving the birthright to the son, Jacob, instead of to the son it should have been Esau. Now I've already told you what the son Esau did when he realized he was deceived. He was a result of the mongoloid race. The Edomite race. Now they come in all colors. Why do they come in all colors? Well, read and you'll find out in Genesis that Esau married an Ishmaelite and a Hittite. So he married white and black and mixed in. So there'll be black Mongoloids and there'll be white Mongoloids. They'll come in all races. You understand me? So when this woman deceived her husband, they placed the wrong son in authority. He was supplanted. This Jacob, or Yaakov, 
was put in the place of his older brother Esau, his twin by the way. Now, the Israelite nation says that Esau, because his name became Edom, and Edom means red or to blush, you know, the term blushy in the cheeks, was the father of the white race. There's black people that blush red. They blush and their face turns red. That means that they are part of the white race? No. Just admit it's a mistake. And let's move on to the truth. So now what happens is Jacob fathers 12 sons by four wives because the genes have been scrambled. The devil did a good job of scrambling our genes. That was his thing. You follow that? 